Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning to the co-chairs press conference. We will start right now. Um, we are missing one of our co-chairs who will join. Um, that's Luisa uh, Elena Tajano. She will join a little bit later in the press conference. So welcome to the World Economic Forum Latin America 2018. The theme is Latin America at a turning point, shaping the new narrative. We have a distinguished panel of co-chairs who will be here for the entire meeting and who will share with you now um, their expectations um, for the meeting, but also about this region. So um, I will introduce um, our panelists today, and then each of them will explain a little bit what they expect for the meeting and, and uh, for the region. So we have um, Candido Botelo Bracher, who's the CEO of Itao Unibanco Brazil, then uh, Mr. Paul Bulke, who's chairman of the board of Nestle. Um, we have Maria Cristina Frias, member of the board and columnist for Pola de Sao Paulo. Um, Michael, Michael Gregoire, CEO of uh, CA Technologies, the US. Uh, Luis Carlos Trabuco Capi, who is the chairman of Banco Bradesco Brazil. And then Nengay Woods, dean of Blavatnik School of Government of the University of Oxford, UK. We will have um, Luisa Helena Trajano, chairwoman of the board of directors of the Magazine Luisa, um, joining us a little bit later. So, the floor is yours, please. Thank you, Jan. I was told it is okay to speak in Portuguese, so with your yes, permission absolutely. here, there, I'll absolutely. speak Portuguese. We have translation. Okay. It's a huge pleasure to be here. I believe that the World Economic Forum in Latin America is taking place at a very timely uh, moment for Latin America. Our region is uh, resuming its growth period, and this is specifically true for Brazil. We are also facing several challenges, recent challenges for foreign trade, with now with protectionist measures uh, being taken around the world. And we are going to have elections in five countries, Colombia, Mexico, Brazil, Costa Rica, and Paraguay. In all these elections, it's possible to identify the same forces at play. We have forces that are present all around the world. Some are more populist, some are more conservative, and we have new, the new uh, forces also uh, taking shape. Um, the debates for these elections in Latin America um, are connected to sustainability, economic growth, what are the necessary measures to ensure uh, economic growth in a sustainable manner, and improving income distribution. There are um, gains for the populations, practical gains, and also debates for the medium turn about productivity. We live in a world of huge technological development, and the quality of education is key to reach uh, competitiveness in countries, amongst other factors, of course. In the next two days, I hope that we will have very interesting discussions. I'm sure we will learn a lot about all these subjects. And we're going to try to understand what are the avenues and the paths that Brazil and Latin America will take in the Thank next you very much. years. Mr. Boca. Well, um, uh, bom dia. Um prazer estar aqui. Uh, and I'm going to do it in English. Uh, but it's a pleasure to be here. And, and, and actually, I'm delighted uh, uh, to be have been invited to co chair um, this event here, the WEF event. And, uh, for Latin America here in Sao Paulo. And for many reasons. First, a personal reason, I've been linked with the continent, Latin America and South America for quite a while in my life. I actually started my career for my company Nestle here in 
uh, not in Brazil, but in Latin America, have been here in Latin America for 17 years. So there's a bit of emotion there uh, of, 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 hey, um, it's my continent too. And professionally uh, also, as I said, 17 years of my professional life. But my company, Nestle, has been in Latin America almost 100 years. It's 89 years in, in Brazil uh, with factories, and we are almost in every country. So uh, we are pretty much uh, deeply involved in, in, in the continent. And, and we have been here in good and bad times, uh, I remember. Uh, we had sometimes ups and downs in the continent, and we have stayed and, and have been part of it. So that's another one, and uh, still investing very hard. But also another thing, I, I feel that, that Latin America somewhere, and the title says a turning point, and then shaping a new narrative. I'm a little bit, turning points, we had so many turning points, and we never took the right turn uh, somewhere. And that's why we start speak again about the turning point and, and shaping the new narrative. So let's have new hope. Uh, somewhere I say it with some frustration because that Latin America seems like the continent of the permanent future. And, and yet, this time, I feel something is happening that is really inducing some, some optimism. Uh, 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 it's an important time. We have lots of elections, I think six, maybe seven, uh, this year, and actually also six next year. Uh, so there is a um, democratic refreshment uh, uh, through going through the whole continent that allows us to have these hopes. But uh, there's political change, in other words. So, the economic outlook looks not bad uh, worldwide, so it is not only here, but worldwide, so it is in, an, in a broader context, and that is a wave that Latin America should serve if you, um, uh, um, in the sense for, of their natural resources, agriculture, etc., has been always one of the strengths of Latin America. So that should play into the two demographics, and this is this, the demographic uh, div, uh, dividend that is playing in youth, and it's still to be played out in the next 20 years, so it's an opportunity to grasp don't, we should not lose that either. Technology is going to help too. I remember so well when the uh, mobile or the cell phone uh, was introduced in the world. Well, Latin America was one of these continents that embraced these new technologies very fast. So that's another one. And, 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 but many challenges. Again, uh, Latin America is known for weak institutions. Uh, productivity is not high. It is more labor induced. Uh, we have uh, the governance, corruption. Um, income inequality. So we have all the possible problems, and yet at the same time, it's, 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 it's an opportunity to start embracing this. I would really, and I think that's the reason why we have the WEF here too, to talk things over and start really having some discipline and getting the right things over time with traction. And government has a role to play, industries have a role to play, um, also um, uh, society has a role to play. But it is like, look, let's not lose now once for once the chance of doing the right things. Stop the experiments and do what is obvious, which is uh, really driving the economical engine, distribute uh, what it creates, uh, start having more institutions and, 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 and frame society better, etc. And that's why I'm motivated. And let's, let's, let's embrace this opportunity and this spark of hope for the continent. We own it to the people, I think. Thank you very much, uh, Paul. Um, media will be happy to see that media is also represented uh, um, on, on stage today uh, with our co-chair. So Maria, Christina, please. Thank you, Jan. Uh, thank you for the invitation. It's uh, an honor to be exactly. here representing uh, the daily newspapers from Sao Paulo, Folia de Sao Paulo, and between the uh, uh, so preeminent co-chairs to sum it up, one of my expectations, which are numerous, as a candidate has uh, said it, it's a very opportune forum. It's a satisfaction to see the World Economic Forum back to Brazil after so many years of absence and uh, 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 committing uh, a very good way uh, the business community and social community in Brazil. This is times when you s when you face difficulties and new tasks to be done with uh, problems of worrying uh, on for international trade this is a very moment to discuss our, our relations on the world uh, sphere our problems of competitiveness also 
I think we're going to benefit from those debates of what we need, we can learn from the Davos community. Uh, on a second level, relevant issues are, as always, education, the fight against corruption, and the social entrepreneurship. Folie de saint Paul our uh, newspaper has a very fruitful uh, partnership, a 14-year-old partnership with the Schwab Foundation. We'll have some uh, awardees who will, uh, will receive the, the title of, of uh, uh, entrepreneur, uh, Social Entrepreneur of the Year. It's developing uh, with Apex. I don't know if you're all aware of it. It's a, a more humanistic model of uh, panel management for prisons, penitentiaries, with uh, high levels of recovery of inmates. And to close it up, we just have a, a panel about fake news where we debated the aspects of, because fake news is always tempting to, to try to protect the the electors uh, with a uh, more rigid legislation i think uh, electors uh, voters must be exposed to all kind of information it is better than they look for uh, uh, trustworthy sources of information than letting government or other people uh, deciding what is good for them or not that's why once again education i think it's the and uh, it's the remedy f against uh, fake news and I think it is uh, of the utmost importance that the business community think to support initiatives uh, uh, focused for the use so that they understand the difference between f uh, fake news, false information, or distorted information, and uh, information uh, published with seriousness and, and uh, uh, trustworthiness. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Maria Cristina. Mr. Grigua. Well, thank you. First, I'd like to thank my esteemed colleagues here as co-chairs. Very honored to be part of this team. Um, when we take a look at Latin America, we're an American company that's been driving technology in Latin America for an awful long time. If you just look over the last three years, it's a little clouded with respect to some of the economic issues that have happened in Latin America, but if you take a look over the last 16 years, there's been tremendous progress and tremendous momentum in Latin America. You know, extreme poverty has gone down by almost 50 percent. Uh, Two-thirds of women are now participating in the labor force. Uh, first grade to eighth grade is pretty much universal. Infant mortality has been reduced by 65 percent. But when we stop and pause, and echoing on Paul's words, now is the time to really think about change and progress. And the thing that's really happening on a global basis is this concept of the fourth industrial revolution. And that has a very significant technical component, which pretty much affects all economies, social welfare, and how people feel about the dignity of their work and how they can participate in the fourth industrial revolution. When we start thinking about that and looking at LATAM, and what I expect to see at the World Economic Forum here in LATAM this year is a deeper conversation of how does LATAM move from a primarily commodities-based GDP um, force to something that is more in line with the technical revolution that we're seeing on a global basis. LATAM is the third biggest internet economy in the world, and yet they don't rank in the top 10 of technical producers. In order for LATAM to really achieve its true potential, we have to take a look at the issues that hold it back from truly participating in the fourth industrial revolution, which is going to hit a lot of the social causes that we've talked about. Education, transparency, skills refreshment, the ability to participate and compete on a global level. These are all very big, salient topics that I think uh, the forum plays a very good part in leading the discussion. But coming out of the discussion, I hope that we have concrete actions to help LATAM, LATAM really achieve its true potential. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Trebo Kokapi. Please. Okay, Bom dia a todos. 
Good morning to all. I think, uh, first of all, it's a, a huge pleasure to be with the, this culture. I'm uh, enthusiastic uh, uh, about the organization of this. Já faz parte da história do mundo, pois há décadas é, tem sido local de debate, de novas ideias, de ideias racionais. Ideas, rational ideas, ideas able to change the world, as is the slogan of this uh, year's World Economic Forum. Uh, we from Latin America, we have many things to uh, achieve. It's obvious that uh, situations of the 21st century, the 20th century have given us a, a valuable heritage uh, as for the environment, uh, women's rights, uh, respect to diversity, respect to of minority, but mainly in the 20th century, globalization has become something irreversible. Why? Because it came from the uh, the change of uh, production uh, models within the f f the concept of fourth industrial revolution, uh, as to the book published. So I'm not. I'm neither optimistic nor pessimistic. I think that the debate within this forum is to uh, talk about realism. Uh, globalization brought us a mode of governance, a way to of public for public management. As been quoted, uh, there will be six, six elections uh, held here in, the, in Latin America. It's not a, a motive for concern; it's an opportunity, because more important than election is the commitment that the uh, next elected uh, representative will have towards rationality. There are no more place for experiences or uh, adventures in the world because Latin America has a social debt for a long time. And this social debt can only be uh, retrieved through growth, through GDP. There is no other way. Uh, obviously, technology and digitalization and education are uh, core options to change the world. But uh, Latin American population, mainly in Brazil, with millions of, uh, of unemployed and sub-employed uh, people, we can, uh, there is only one therapy, the therapy of growth. The, the GDP, the GDP per capita, this is where you can tap into to give uh, some social comfort so that we have a more uh, equit equitative society, a more humane and less violent. Latin America has shown a low growth rate. Brazil is coming back from a recession, is recovering from a recession. Uh, I hope that, uh, this res uh, that this recovery won't be cyclic, but uh, the recovery f uh, of this growth from 2018 is a, an opportunity for us to create uh, a base for the future. Latin America has, has experience on a political level, on the economic level, within governments, and as ethics is concerned, mature and immature times. Now we are ready to debate future. The past, we all know that it it uh, it. Uh, it not always has been a harmonious past and present we can discuss, and the future we can lead with new processes and new politics. Uh, obviously, when Brazil declared a default in the 80s, uh, some uh, Wall Street reactions, they were saying that Brazil was the, the future that never comes. But we need to anticipate the future through reforms, through processes, uh, uh, permit allowing progress. I think that's what the, the World Economic Forum is about, and uh, we're enthusiastic to be taking part of those debates. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, uh, Mr. Nagar Woods. Please, if you would like Thank to Thank you. Good morning. Um, it's a huge pleasure to be here at the Latin American WEF and to be co chairing it. At the Blavatnik School of Government at Oxford University, we, we bring really brilliant current and future leaders from this continent to the school to learn from other countries, to learn from other sectors, to learn across disciplines. And it cannot do anything but make me optimistic about the prospects for this region. But my hope for the next day and a half is really an ambitious one. Um, 
across Latin America, as across other parts of the world, there is a huge anti-establishment revolt happening in politics. In almost every democratic election in the world, we're seeing more than half the population vote against the establishment. And I think that means we've got to do three things together, starting at this meeting. And the first is to really come up with a new economic model. Nothing short of that. Workers across this continent are facing a technological competition on one side, jobs taken by robots, and an outsourcing competition on the other. What we're seeing across certainly the whole of the OECD is that for 50% of working people, wages have either gone down or they've stagnated. The Financial Times told us two days ago that at the same time, the personal income tax on those workers has gone up by 6%. And yet on the other side, the Financial Times tell us that the 10 largest technology companies who have hugely increasing rates of revenue have had a, a rapidly reduced tax, effective tax rate. So our economic model is not working to deliver something which a majority of people think is fair and are willing to support. And that's the first element of the populist re revolt. And I feel we all, it's going to take the brains and the energy of the private sector, the public sector, the not-for-profit sector who have come together here in Sao Paulo to start thinking about what is the economic model that's going to give people a chance to work and to improve their livelihoods through hard work. The second challenge is a new transformative politics. Establishment political parties and leaders are losing everywhere. And that's not surprising when half their population feels that they've lost something. People have loss aversion. Psychologists would tell you that it matters much more to people what they're losing than, it, than, than, they, than they weigh the gains of what they might increase. So it's no, there's no point establishment politicians promising a 1% increase in GDP, because that is not capturing and transforming the anxiety of their population. We need a new transformative politics across this region, where politicians think more boldly about how to deliver to the concerns that most of their population are meeting. And that means listening carefully. Learn from the successful cases. Learn from the French um, campaign that Emmanuel Macron ran to listen to what people's concerns really were and to ensure that politics is responding to those concerns. Learn from the populists themselves about how to simplify your messages, simplify your communication, and make sure you're genuinely representing the people. Otherwise, establishment politicians and political parties will continue to lose. But I think we can do it. We can do a new transformative politics. And then thirdly, we need a new international cooperation. And here I'm optimistic that working together we can do this. Think about the Paris climate change negotiations. They came about actually not because governments led. They came about because private sector leaders led, because communities got together and led. There was a groundswell that pushed governments together in Paris. And when President Trump said that he was withdrawing the United States, the momentum did not collapse. Instead, every single country in the world joined the Paris, peace process, the Paris climate change process. And now only the United States is not a participant. So the possibilities for new international cooperation are there, and it's going to take private sector leaders, government leaders, not-for-profit leaders, leaders from across society to really seize the opportunity to push for new international cooperation. So that's my agenda for this Latin American WEF. It's a new economic model, it's a transformative politics, and it's seizing the opportunity to frame new kinds of international cooperation. So thank you for hosting us. Thank you very much for sharing your, your views. Uh, I, I still hope that your, your uh, uh, 
fellow co-chair, Ms. Trajano, uh, will join. She has another session, so um, she might still be able to join and uh, add to your views. Uh, meanwhile, we have a little bit of time uh, for some questions uh, from the media. Um, if you have a question, please introduce yourself um, and uh, ask the question to one of the co-chairs. Um, or several. So we have one question here in the second row. If you can get a microphone, please. It's on, yeah. Oh, can we can we put the microphone on, please? Can you try it again? Yes. Okay. Good morning. My name is Sibeli Amado from the state of Bahia. I'm a social entrepreneur. At the World Economic Forum in Davos in 2016, Antonio Guterres, the Secretary General of the UN, made an amazing speech about an innovative moment, a movement in the private world and partnership for social issues. He said that there was a bipolar relation of sorts. So the private initiative is doing their thing and social initiatives. And he proposed a multipolarity instead of a bipolarity. So the possibility of putting together uh, private resources and social projects in one single project. That's my question. What do you think about this idea? And how can we move forward in that sense? You want to, to direct this question to one coach in particular, or should we? Is, yes, please. But right, if you would like to for all of, for, for all of, uh, the panelists. Sorry, and then come to you. I can give one concrete example. As part of the WEF, the IT Governors Council, which is um, the group of the largest technology companies that are linked together, we meet like most of the uh, the WEF industry forums. We've banded together and put together a skills portal uh, to deal with. Uh, Nari's point, there's going to be some job displacement for sure with the fourth industrial revolution as technology starts permeating on a global basis. And the issue we're trying to solve is how do we help people participate in this economy by skills retraining? So we put together a portal. Um, it's in the early days. It will go live uh, globally at the end of March. It's English language only at first, but you have 11 companies that compete fiercely all day, every day on a global basis, step back from our competitive instincts and put a lot of our training together, uh, our digital training on AI, cybersecurity, um, Java and programming languages, agile management, all the fundamental skills that you would need to participate in the you know, fourth industrial revolution. And we're providing that for free. Um, we're going to add more course curriculum. We're going to try to deal with some of the language barriers. There's a skills assessment that anybody can take that will rank you with respect to how digitally aware you are and then give you opportunities to move into different segments of you know, your own digital training. This is uh, something that's in the early stages, but it's an example of a, you know, a private consortium trying to help solve the education issue we have, especially with displaced workers. Adding to, actually the question induces some thinking in the sense of, hey, um, a private sector and, 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 and politics and society, can they work together? And, and I don't see anything of a contradiction there in the sense that actually economical activity is all about being a positive force in, in society, is, is doing something for uh, producing products or services, or, and if you do that with the right purpose, and you do that with the right set of values, it should be positive. It should be possible to do that together. A good example of, of, of uh, public-private um, engagement uh, is, is, for example, the Water Resource Group that I um, have the privilege of co-chairing, which is basically going after this very, very important problem of, of water and sanity and hydration. And, and in many parts of the world, this is a huge problem. And, and actually, uh, it is to become a, a big problem worldwide if we don't care for it. Well, the World Resource Group is actually a platform where, where uh, the private sector, together with, with civil society, together with governments, are looking locally uh, for specific solutions um, and doing that with a system and uh, a discipline that we can share because there's best practice, you can learn from each other. 
But then we land that, and it's a, it's a multi-stakeholder initiative then locally, uh, where basically we want government to own it, because that's the frame that you have to have. But the whole concept is multi-stakeholder engagement of, of the different parts of society about the problem that touches everybody. And then you say, why would the private sector do that? Well, for example, in my industry, if you don't have water, you don't have uh, uh, agricultural uh, materials, you need water to make a good coffee. Um, uh, we, we, uh, there's not many places of the world where water is not important. So doing that, it makes also business sense to a certain extent. So it is not, hey, let business forget to be business and do something for society. No, it is intrinsically linked with what business should stand for. And I think that's a little bit the, the tone that I felt in, in the question. Is it possible? Hey, it should be natural. Thank you. Did you, have, did you want to add to that? No? Okay. Thank you. And I mean, let me add to that. That's what the World Economic, World Economic Forum is about. It's multi-stakeholder engagement. Make sure that uh, the different uh, players work together. Do we have another question from the floor? Yes, here in the, in the back. If you could get a microphone there, please. If you could introduce yourself, please. Good morning. My name is Andrea Italo. I work for Agência Estado. It's a news agency. I have a question for Mr. Trabuco and Mr. Brasher. You both talked about the elections that will take place in Latin America this year, specifically about Brazilian elections that will take place. What is your expectation, both of you, uh, about what's going to happen in Brazil? What is the main risk that you see the results of the election, can they have an impact on credit and on economic growth for next year? Thank you for your question, Andre. Elections in Brazil will take place at a key point. Our country has just left a huge recession. We've had modest growth this far but we are preparing to grow even further this year. My feeling is that this year we have a growth that is more or less defined. We are going to have elections in October. That's more to the end of the year. We have more demand. So I don't see a huge impact of elections in our economy this year. However, this is going to be of the utmost importance for the next years. Currently, Brazil has is, is in full condition of having sustainable growth for a long period of time. Inflation is under control. Interest rates are the lowest we've had, and they can remain so for a long time. The external scenario is favorable and sound. We have reserves low current accounts deficit, we have foreign direct investment. So we are in very good conditions. What do we lack? Well, it's a fiscal risk. It's a, ta ta a tax risk. There is an unbalance in public accounts. Public debt uh, is on a growing trend. And this is the main problem we will face, or the new president we will face. Of course, uh, Nge, Mrs. Nge Woods mentioned several problems. We can't have uh, uh, a speech that says, well, the GDP is going to grow, or I'm going to balance public accounts. How is that going to bring benefits to the population? So we have a um, broad group of candidates. They're not defined yet, but several of them are concerned about this. They are concerned with tax issues, uh, the balance of our public accounts, so that the country can have sustainable growth. My expectation is that we will have positive results from this election and that the country will grow in the next few years. Well, uh, Mr. Brasher uh, gave a very good reply. Your question is if the elections can mean turmoil. Well, elections can mean uh, volatile times. 
But elections are an opportunity, in fact. They are an important opportunity for Brazilian society. We will be able to scrutinize government plans and projects for, for, future, for candidates and future governors. And then we will be able to decide and to choose something that is crucial for Latin America, which is what's the state model we want. Globalization and the way the world uh, does public management, well, that has changed indeed. And it's evident that's, that an election uh, that will reaffirm the belief in a state that is not centralizing, that is not uh, inducing growth. But we must believe that we have a new society. So elections are indeed an opportunity. And we must reach a consensus around government plans that will make our country move ahead. What is key is the commitment of candidates with reforms. We must have a cap for spending, and this is really important. But it's not enough if we don't have the right reforms in place. Just having a cap in spending without a balancing in public accounts, well, that will uh, leave us in the same uh, situation. Public deficit, if we have an unbalance in our tax system, that will make the state uh, incapable of investing above all in social uh, social investment. So elections are an opportunity. That's how I see it. Mm. Close this uh, press conference. Um, we have uh, Ms. Pajano who, who joined us and who will give her the chance also to share her views for the coming days. I was at a different debate uh, in another room. I just heard the, uh, my colleagues speaking, yes, Brazil had a political and economic crisis. We are used to economic crisis, right? F what I've felt is our maturity to separate politics from economy. Oftentimes, politics uh, is um, giving us events, so the dollar is not going up and the stock markets are fine. This is a sign of maturity. And we are uh, seeing a light at the end of the tunnel. We see better things happen. It's great to have this forum here. There are two important things to people. 60% of Brazil's population uh, makes uh, less than 2,000 reais a month. That's the family income. This is intolerable. This is terrible. A family uh, that makes less than 2,000. And 13% uh, don't make a lot of money as well. So more people are getting rich and more people. So we have uh, 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 very few people with a lot and a lot of people with very few. And that uh, is about jobs. In a developing country, jobs can improve the economy. Jobs and income, that's what leads people in poor countries to have a better situation. And we have a sad level of unemployment. Four years ago, we had a good level of employment. So this forum. You know, the economy is an engine to improve our situation regarding the elections. There has been so much turmoil, and we are not even starting to think about this election because they're not defined yet. But our people is not the same. They will demand for their rights after the last three or four years we've gone through with so many news. So like Mr. Trabuco mentioned, and Candido as well. Elections are a sign of maturity. Politicians cannot do what they did in the past. People are not gonna, going to accept this. Uh, the civil society is very much united in Brazil, more than before. And I believe in change through uh, union in civil society. If civil society is not united, there's no change, and we need profound changes. I believe we've become protagonists in Brazilian history. Civil society is a protagonist. So we have 800 women. Uh, we have 1,200 women that have no political intention, but they want to take ownership of this country with this movement of women. So society is, is actually um, holding grasp of the situation and of our political life. That's a sign of maturity. I'm very glad to have this economic forum in Brazil. This uh, health and employment 
are key for our people. Thank you very much to our co-chairs today. Thank you for, for being here. Thank you to our media. Um, thank you for being here at the press conference. I wish you all a very successful day today and tomorrow for, for this meeting. Thank you.